this morning and everybody online on Facebook and watching later on our uh, YouTube video. Uh, Deborah Tankersley is out of town, so I'm going to be announcements today. So what a lovely day to wake up and the sun is shining and we get to come to church. Amen. A great day. A few announcements. First of all, uh, we want to welcome Andrew and Mary as our choir director. a very blessed congregation to be able to have them with us. Uh, also, you'll notice some announcements in your bulletin. Uh, one in particular I'd like to stress because it's my announcement um, about the security system update and anybody that's interested in uh, donating any funds to pay for that, uh, just make sure that you put security cameras on your check and we'll make sure that it gets into the right account. Also, we've got a busy week in the uh, Methodist congregation here in the state of Virginia. This week is conference week coming up uh, Wednesday through Saturday. And many of you, are, uh, once again, a blessing in this church to have so many people willing to volunteer to help out. Amanda has sent out notices, uh, emails, and text messages to everybody who has volunteered to confirm that you know when you're supposed to be at the church. She is going to have training day on Tuesday with um, the person in charge of the registrations. And I don't think uh, that that would be too hard a thing for us to uh, get over to you volunteers on uh, Wednesday, when you come in on Wednesday or Thursday, whichever day you're assigned. So we'll know, we don't know anything exactly right now, but we'll know by Tuesday afternoon what the procedure will be. Also, because of the conference, and Doug will not be in the office uh, much at all this week, I guess we'll be in Monday, Tuesday, Monday, just Monday. So Tuesday through Saturday, he will be unavailable except for emergencies, and you can, um, you can uh, call him up on his cell phone in the event of emergency. We'll get hold of him, and uh, hopefully nothing comes up. Otherwise, I don't see any other announcements. Does anybody else have an announcement? needs to be made. Um, hearing none, we'll um, move into our service.
look in, I'll read the light print, and you can read the vault. Eternal God, in the reading of your scripture, may the word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may the word be done. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may the word be done. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. In your pew Bible, you can follow along on page 17. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I have showed you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah and Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. They, then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. That ends our first lesson. Our second lesson is going to be on page 767 in your hymnal. It's Psalm number 33, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12, but we're going back to an old tradition that we used to do by singing the response. And in this instance, we're going to sing response number 2. And what's going to happen is uh, Andrew is going to play it one time through so you get the tune, and then we'll sing the response, and then everywhere there's an R appearing in the... In the uh, in the book, then we'll sing the response again. He 
was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Hymn of preparation, also in the hymnal, number 467, Trust and Obey, is dangerous.
As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. The Word of God.
going around social media that's a take on the humor of Jeff Foxworthy. It says that if you have an address label pasted to the bottom of a casserole dish, you might be United Methodist. <laughs> we love to eat together, and I'm kind of amused by the fact that there are churches that talk about that as if that's unique to them. Because every Christian church I've known has enjoyed getting together to eat with one another in a potluck or some other occasion. And it's not that we don't have access to restaurants or that we don't know how to open up and heat a can of soup at home. There's something essential about table fellowship to the life of a congregation. And it's also a part of our traditional and biblical heritage. Here we have a passage in the Gospels today that has Jesus eating with someone. He's eating with Matthew, who's also called Levi in other Gospels, who was a tax collector. He meets him and he calls him to follow him. And then immediately after that, we find him in Matthew's home, surrounded by other tax collectors having a meal. You will recall that I told you that in the early Christian church, Christians met in homes. And they met once a week, where the Sabbath day moves from Friday night to Sundays, because that's the day the, day the Lord's resurrection is celebrated. And they met around the table for a meal. And each of the Gospel writers probably came out of one of those house churches. So when Luke writes this Gospel, with all of these references to Luke, to Jesus eating with other people, those who were sitting around the table of fellowship as they worshipped would have recognized themselves in their own setting. Oh yes, here's another story about Jesus dining with other people just as we are communing with Jesus in spirit. And under the circumstances, you've got a tax collector, or some translations refer to it as a toll collector. And he, is in, he goes into his home with others and with Jesus to have a meal. And the Pharisees call him out on this. Now the Pharisees were leaders in the synagogue. They were laity. They would not have been ordained like rabbis were. And they would have assisted the rabbis in teaching the law and making sure that everybody obeyed the law of Moses. For those of you who grew up Baptist, they're like deacons in the Baptist tradition. Or in our tradition, they'd be like lay servants or lay speakers. The Pharisees were to the synagogues at that day what Helen and Kevin and Keith are to us in our ministry here. And they're just doing their job in this case. Eating with other people was something that could be risky if they weren't a part of your group. You might eat something that is unclean, something that the Bible forbids people to eat, like shrimp or the back half of a cow. And also, tax collectors were a group with which the Pharisees had a particular ax to grind. For generations now, Israel has been a part of another empire. The Roman Empire at the time of our Gospels and the Greek Empire before that. They are subjects of Rome, but they do not have the rights and privileges of Roman citizens. So having to pay taxes adds insult to injury. Not only are we oppressed, but we even have to finance this oppression. So they call Jesus out on it. And Jesus quotes to them a familiar saying, one that predates him. Those who are not sick do not need a physician. And there are multiple ways to interpret what he means by this and the exchange that happens here with the Pharisees. I take that to mean what Paul was referring to in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I take that to be Jesus' way of saying to the Pharisees who are, who are challenging him, 
these people with whom I'm dying, dining, acknowledge that um, they need my help. But you do not, because you're too wrapped up in yourself and in your work. Now, it's important to think about how people are betrayed in the Gospels. Luke is writing a Gospel, which means he is sharing his theology. Specifically, it is his Christology. He is talking about who Jesus was and is, the impact that Jesus had on his life and on the church of his day, and the impact that Jesus has on others. That means that none of the Gospel writers are writing biographies in the way we think of it. Not like a modern-day biographer who might be an academic or an investigative journalist, someone who is examining original documents and double-checking resources. Luke is completely biased, and all of the others are too. He's telling the story of his faith in God. And so Christ is the central figure who overshines everyone else. That's the way the Gospels are meant to be written. But it means that some of the other characters, like Pharisees and tax collectors, can be a bit two-dimensional. Now in Luke's second volume, The Acts of the Apostles, we find that there were Pharisees who also became a part of the early Christian movement and those who were integral as leaders in the Christian church as they had been in the synagogues. It's also true that there are tax collectors who are viewed the way we would view extortionists or gangsters, but there are others who are respected members of their community. Both are kind of broadly painted in this particular picture. Whenever we have a prejudice of some sort, it does simplify our lives. We can look at somebody and see how someone appears or is dressed. We can think about someone as a part of a group that that person is affiliated with. And it saves us from having to think about them. It saves us from having to look at them and consider who they really are. It makes it simple because we can just portray them a certain way and write them off if that portrayal is negative. But that's not the way Jesus looks at people. Jesus sits down with those that society ostracizes. Jesus dines with people. Jesus talks to people. And lives are transformed as a result of that. And people become new creations and disciples of Jesus Christ. And the habit of table fellowship is one of the ways that you and I continue this tradition. It gives us the opportunity to sit across the table from one another and find out who somebody is. That's true on a larger scale. When you consider how churches have festivals, the way Dean and I went to the Lebanese festival recently and were engaged with other people we knew there, and how the priest was giving people tours of the sanctuary and teaching them about that tradition, or the way I've run into members of this church at the Syrian festival, along with the people there who were inviting people to come in and dine and to help fundraise for the church, but also to know more about who they are and their particular traditions. It's what you and I do when we celebrate the country breakfast every three months. And those of you who I so appreciate who buy tickets to give away to other people, to invite people to come in, not just to have a meal, but to get to know us. And how many of us have become a part of this church because we came here and we worshiped for a few Sundays, but then one day there was a meal after the service, the way we had last week. And you were invited to come in and sit with somebody and talk to them. And you found out about them and they found out about you. When we eat with people, we engage on a very intimate level, and that's how relationships are born, and that's how disciples are formed. I've had the opportunity as a pastor to be involved with various food banks and soup kitchens, and to serve people who have come in and dined at those particular establishments. 
Now normally from time to time in my life, I don't have much interaction with the poor. Those are neighborhoods that I tend not to drive through, and there are people on the sidewalk that I just tend to walk past. But there's something about being involved in those sorts of ministries that invite me not only to serve, but to sit down and engage in conversation with people that opens up my eyes to who my brothers and sisters are. The poor can be demonized in our day, our political rhetoric is sometimes responsible for this, portraying the poor as people who are lazy and unambitious and want to live off of someone else's dime. But whenever you engage with other people, that brings about an entirely new sense of who someone is. In a previous appointment, I volunteered the, during one day, the first week of the month, with people from my church who served lunch at a particular soup kitchen. This particular establishment served the poor 365 days of the year. And in addition to the meal, they also had food that was donated from local grocers and also from other restaurants. And so oftentimes people would not only have a meal there, but they'd take food home. Any time a pastor was involved to participate in this program, you were called on to say the prayer before the meal began. The loyal volunteers from my church who worked at this always had the same menu on that day. They had crab cakes with coleslaw, with baked pinto beans, and cornbread. And whenever I sat down to eat, I always put onions in my pinto beans and crumbled cornbread on them. Now, I warned Sharon yesterday, I would mention her today in my sermon, because if you know her, you know that's also her favorite meal, too, of pinto beans with cornbread. And she's told multiple people that when her time comes, after the service, we're to go to the round room and enjoy baked beans with cornbread. Well, on a number of occasions, I sat there and I ate with people who came to this particular soup kitchen. And I learned some very fascinating things about it. I learned there was one man who was a regular there who worked 40 hours a week for a major retailer. But he was there because he made minimum wage. And at the end of the month, he wasn't able to make ends meet. And so he needed this to supplement what he was able to do. There was another man who was a senior citizen who said to me that he was on a budget and if he wasn't there, he could go home and have a peanut butter and banana sandwich. But I also found from him that one of the reasons he liked coming to this particular place was all the other people he saw his own age and all the regulars. And they talk about their lives and they talk about current events. So there's not just a poverty of food and material resources, there is a social dimension that's very important and that is filled in that particular location. There's also another man there who had an agricultural background. And one of his big passions was he participated in a community garden that went on in this county. You might remember that when my predecessor, Pastor Joe, came and talked about the ministry of Embrace up in Waynesboro, that's one of the services they have. A garden that's planted, and people from the community are invited to come when it's harvesting time and take whatever they want from there. They're also invited to plant seeds and to help keep it up as well. Well, this man gave back to the community in that way, by planting and by weeding and caring for the crops. And he was very excited because there were some volunteers who were going to donate wildflower seeds. And he was talking about how those would be planted all around the garden so they would attract bees and other pollinators. And also, any time I've worked in that kind of an environment, I've always known people who dined there who were very eager when the meal was done to stack chairs, wipe off tables, and to sweep up. So they didn't feel like they were there as the recipients of charity, which is awkward for any of us, but they felt like they were working to earn their daily bread. That's an example of what happens when we get past our preconceived notions and we sit down 
and we die with one another. That is how relationships are born. That is how stereotypes are overcome. And that is how disciples of Jesus Christ are made. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is in the bulletin, the Apostles' Creed, traditional version. Join us who recite this historic confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary,
joys would you like to share today? Yes. Awesome. Hi. Hey, the sun starts a new job. I, I just, so I'm on the edge of tears this morning. I'm super grateful. Yes. All right. Extractions. Painful, swollen, but she's making it through. Yeah. Yes. Uh, next month, my marching band camp starts, so I can go to marching band camp. Great. All right. Oh, nice to go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Church ever saw that he's loving that. He's equal towards all the letters and prayers. Um, he says it's going to be a fair bit if he doesn't write back because <laughs> he has zero time. Very good. Other joints. Glad that they produce it, they're producing time. Great recovery. Yes. I'm very proud to be here. I have a lease. And All right, yeah. Then, as we move into concerns, are there per concerns you'd like to lift up? Yes. 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 Prayers, his blood work came back. It's not in the right direction. Hmm. Yeah, Dan. Since he's having the shoulder surgery this coming Friday. Okay. Yeah. Aileen Newer has been in the hospital. Yes. My two sisters. Uh, one's dealing with Alzheimer's, and the other, her husband's a uh, hospice. Yes. Continued prayers for my brother and sister. They are improving, but still on the right track. Other concerns? We have an unspoken with her. Our prayer today is based on our gospel passage from Matthew. Let us pray. Lord, you approach the disciples while they were going about their workaday routine. They were invited to leave all behind and join you on the life-changing journey. Northview Church members have been educated, practiced a trade, and reared families. Each of us has heard a call to advance your kingdom on earth. Forgive us for times we turn a deaf ear to the sound of your voice. Heal our illness of iniquity so we can be fully committed to your will. Bring recovery to everyone who has been held back by physical infirmities. Empower us to care for the sick and disabled. Make this congregation receptive to sojourners who enter our sanctuary. They too have heard your call. Bless this church's ministry of hospitality as we continue to make disciples in your name. Hear us now as we offer the prayer you taught them, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is also in the hymnal, number 470, 473, Leave Me, Lord, and we'll sing this twice. Please stand your hand.
Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.